What's going on, Badger fans? Really good show. We got Coach's Corner today. Uh, talked about offensive execution. Where does some of that blame lie? And initial thoughts from the coach on Braden Locke. First, first look, does he think there's more there? Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers, your team every single day. Really do appreciate everybody tuning in as always. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash Locked On College. Use code Locked On College for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. That's on Prize Picks. Um, let's get Coach Anderson in. We do Coach's, Coach's Corner every Wednesday. It's one of my favorite shows of the week. But before I do, because I'm going to lose this when I my screen shrinks, when you get a chance, very few people are making content uh, covering the Badgers like Coach Anderson. Go subscribe to the Dairy Raid on YouTube. It's free. It supports his channel, his content, and his his stuff is completely unique and original and fantastic. So go give him a follow when you can. All right, let's bring Coach in. Not the, the funnest rewatch of <laughs> Iowa, Coach. No, not now. And like I was kind of saying before, it it's a combination of it wasn't as bad as I thought, and it was a lot worse than I thought all at the same time. There were a lot of good things that I liked, but the the bad just outweighed it like crazy. And it was just frustrating to, just to see how how much it just did not work at times. Yeah, that's very frustrating. I, I want to actually, we have kind of a whole line of things we want to talk about, but I actually want to pivot just a little bit based on what you just said. Because we've done several shows, the reaction show, uh, another show, a call-in show. I feel like we've hammered home a lot of the pain points. What was, you said there were some things that we did really well. Um, what were a few, one or two things that stood out to you watching the rewatch that you're like, oh, we executed pretty well there. There was a lot better mix of passing concepts than we've had previous uh saw a lot more of the double post concept saw a little bit better uh versions of the all curl running running dagger out of a different formation you know that that kind of mix it was nice to see uh, i thought the outside zone run game for the most part was was working pretty well um and that set up some of the intermediate okay hit a couple of the uh, the rpos off of it but it's that it's that growing within the system aspect that was nice, and also kind of some of the things that was better than I had thought is when when you hear the uh, the narrative it's like oh they threw it what 10, 12 times in a row something like that. You go back and you look at it, it's like okay well there was some RPOs thrown in there there were some package plays put in there so the the play was called as a run but the read was there to throw. And we didn't execute it, or it was a bad throw, or whatever. Um, but those tags are always there. You can't take them away and expect the offense to function how how you want it to, other than just saying, okay, just hand the ball off, which I suppose you could. But it takes away the aspect of the, of the the offense, and we're trying to and we're trying to hold, especially those second level Iowa defenders, uh, the safeties as well, the third level, try to keep them out of the run fit. And we noticed when we got away from that, those safeties got in the front fit and they just started terrorizing us. So this stuff has to be built on top of it. And, you know, so when you, when you go back and you look at it, the narrative, it's, it's not as bad as what the narrative is telling you. Uh, so that was good to see or better to see. It's not, nothing was good out of it. I don't, I don't want to say anything good happened to this game, but. Uh, there were things that were a little better than others. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, it was it wasn't as bad. You hit on something there. there some, that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say you hit on something there that that I think is really interesting. The narrative, because you see just the raw numbers, right? And you see, you mm -hmm. know, you're averaging 4.8 yards per carry. Braylon Allen is. If you're struggling to throw the ball, but to your point, it's it's that that pass threat keeping those safeties back that's maybe allowing Braylon Allen to average at 4.8 yards per carry, right? It, it's yeah, it is threat of the pass game. They're running this. It's the same play. It's just when when the defense doesn't react to the run, Braylon pops off and gets a big run. When the defense reacts to the run, that's where the, the outlet RPO throw comes in. And if we don't throw it, then there's going to be an unblocked defender getting in the run fit. 
So that is that is the give and take. Uh, a lot, I would say, a lot of the plays that we have where where the running back is getting stoned on the line are the plays where where there isn't that access throw or there isn't that RPO in the in the in the background. It is just a straight zone read. So these plays are important, even when they're not working all the time. They're important because they set each other up, and it's an aspect that we can't get rid of for the sake of just handing the ball off. Let me ask you this question. This came from the discord from Badger Gator. He said a question for coach Anderson. Whenever he's back in the pod, I always hear about great offensive coordinators, coaches consistently scheming receivers wide open. He has a couple examples, Sark, Riley, uh, Josh Heupel. Um, He says all seem to generate explosive plays with their play design calls. Is this something Longo doesn't do well, or do we not have the personnel to make these plays work? I expected more based on Longo's track record. Again, this is from Badger Gator, so appreciate the question. Yeah, I think a couple things with that. One, personnel's different. Sarkeesian and Lincoln Riley and Josh Heupel are working with a different caliber receiver than we are right now. That that That's one part of it. Because we're running the same plays. We're running very similar plays. Because, again, they're all in the air raid family, all those uh, with the exception of Sarkeesian, uh, Heupel and Lincoln Riley and Phil Longo are all in the air raid family. There's a lot of similar concepts. It, it doesn't hurt that those teams have high powered athletes at those positions. That's one, two, they have better quarterback play, which you know, we'll, we'll talk about it later when we're comparing Braden to Tanner. Uh, I, Tanner has been part of the problem where this timing and this getting the ball to the receivers where they're supposed to be. He has been part of the issue. So, so that's part of it. But there, there are a lot of ways to scheme a receiver open. And we're doing a lot of them. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to create mismatches, uh, trying to get our – you know, speed versus, you know, we always say hunting for neck rolls, Hunt, trying to get those linebackers and those safeties on the wrong defense. We do that. OK, that's why we get a lot of throws to uh, Will Pauling. That's a mismatch. That's the, that's the thing that we can exploit. Our outside receivers, we're having a, a, more of a problem with that. Uh, when you have somebody like Chimray, who's having problems all year getting off of tight coverage, there's no mishma- mismatch there. Uh, and Brayden or uh, Bryson Green is isn't getting open as, as well as he should, and CJ is young. Uh, you know that's part of it. There's also uh, like rub concepts, mesh concepts, high low concepts to create conflict within the defense. But part of the issue when they're running straight man, if we can't if we can't create that rub, then it's not gonna it's not gonna work. And I and we I've seen this a lot. They they have not run mesh successfully as they were hope, hoping to this year. And there's a bunch of examples over the weekend where you can tell one of the guys got the depth wrong. Uh, umpire stepped in the way. There was a, a great play where it would have been a completion if the umpire didn't step in the way. So that's something else we do. We we we're working on stacking releases where the receivers run in each other's wake to get guys open, and that has been creating open receivers. Uh, using motion to create open receivers. So we're doing everything within the scope of what we try to do as coaches to scheme players open. And we're calling the plays, but I, I'm not, I don't want to use the same word that I've been using every time I've been on here, but it comes down to execution or it comes down to having guys who can play and everything stacks on top of each other. So well, let me ask you really quickly because we got then we got to go into a break. Then we're going to talk about Tanner Mordecai, uh, Braden Locke, and a coaching decision that a lot of people are on either side of the fence on. But in a one sentence answer on this, is it more talent or is it more execution on the edges for Wisconsin? Talent, talent, yeah, talent. I th- I think I think if our talent was a little bit higher, we wouldn't be having this issue. And it also comes down to fit. You know, we have several guys on this team who are still not perfect fits yeah. and whether they're on the team in next year or not, who knows, but there's a lot of nuances to this offense. And we have a lot of players on this team who know, no, no such thing as subtlety and nuance in their game. Yeah. It's a process. In other words, 
All right, coming up, we're going to talk about Braden Locke. Continue talking about the offensive execution a little bit and a coaching decision, all of that on Coach's Corner with Coach Anderson. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about our good friends over the show, at the, oh, at, at the show over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the number one daily fantasy game. It's what we use. It is the most popular, independently owned daily fantasy sports game in North America. Easy, exciting. Um, and it, the best way with the best part of prize picks is you're no longer competing against a thousand, a million other people who are just nerding out to numbers in their, their basement all day, all night, and you have no chance of beating them. With prize picks, it's just you against yourself, you against the stats. You pick two to six players over, under on different yards, uh, passing touchdowns, receiving yards, whatever it is. And that's it. Watch the money roll in. It's quick. It's easy. You can be in and out in under 60 seconds. That's why I use it because it saves time and it's still a ton of fun. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown college. Use code lockdown college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash lockdown college. Use code lockdown college for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, let's get coach back on. Continue this conversation. Um, coach, once again, really do appreciate all your time. Uh, I want to give you a, a quick second. Where can people, I put it up on my whiteboard too, but where can people support what you're doing? Yeah, uh, as always, the Dairy Raid. Um, then my my Iowa breakdown is there in the two videos. Uh, also, if you want to get a little bit of a preview of Braden as a quarterback in the system, I, I've got some of my early, much uh, crappier quality videos of the, the launch down in there. So just, yeah. Go there um, also on Twitter, Substack. Um, if you need a little bit of psychoanalysis, we, I, we dove into on my Substack talking about the identity crisis, the quote unquote identity crisis, the uh, the Badgers offense. So we gave you a step by step guide of how to uh, to solve your identity crisis with your football team. So I love if it. any of the coaching, any of the coaching staffs watching us, they, feel free to use that. I absolutely love it. All right, let, let's go here. Um, we you and I were talking on Twitter. Uh, just about some of the offensive line issues, um, execution issues. And one of the things we we talked about was how fair is it for, to expect players necessarily to execute at a high level when the offensive line has had three different coaches in three years? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. And I will give as, as hard as I've been on the offensive line this year, we still need to remember they are 19 to 22 year old kids. And they've had to change what they've been doing multiple times over the last couple of years and being told that, you know, things like terminology and footwork and things change on a yearly basis. That's really difficult. And maybe we're having some issues where the carryover from Rudolph to Bostead to Bicknell has just the flow has not been quite there. Also, I think this year's staff is is feeling the effects of maybe poor development over the last couple of years. Yes, we've put players in the NFL, um, but those were, I would say, more exceptional talents who exceeded expectations. Um, and now we're kind of seeing where it's maybe hard to teach some of them new things or different ways of doing the same thing because everything they're doing this year they did last year it's probably just taught slightly differently or the footwork slightly different or whatever and when you have to change that over and over again you start getting players who start trying to translate what's going on in their head before it's happening you know oh no this is what we called this last year this is this is that uh you know we called this we called this play this last year it's this now okay that's how i do it and when you when you devote man or brain power to translating what you're doing to remember what you did before, you're not actually learning anything new. You're not taking the new the new aspect of what you're learning is you are just settling on what you already know in the past, and that can create problems because the coach doesn't want you to run your inside zone steps like you did last year. He wants you to run it like he's teaching you this year. Uh, because what he does, what he wants you to do fits the system. So, and then when you ask those guys to change it three times, that can be very different or difficult for sure. Well, and and there, there's an element of, if you have to process anything, you're, you're going, you're not going to be playing naturally as fast, right? Mm -hmm. Like When it's not second nature, like you said, you may have to process it just for a second, a half second. And you're not playing as fast as a guy who's been in a defense, like, let's use Iowa. 
Mm -hmm. You think they're processing anything on that other than just go get ball? No, they, they no. know exactly what they're supposed to do. Exactly. While the Wisconsin offensive line, there's a processing element there. And it looks like we're a, a tenth of a second slow. It's not a ton, but it's enough to disrupt everything. Yeah, th this is the biggest change in what we're doing is just the fact that it's the first thing that's been different in 30 years. You know, it's, as – if you look at Paul Chris's offense in 2022 and you look at Brad Childress's offense in 1995, is there much difference other than, than some formation stuff? It's the same basic thing. Mm -hmm. What Bob Bostead was coaching with the offensive line back in 2006 was the same as what he was doing last year. And so everything that that's, that's what we're talking about with Iowa is Everything was second nature from, from the coaches to the support staff, to the players. It was all second nature. Now we have to reteach that and it's going to take time and it's going to take some players making a decision either to buckle up and really work hard to get it because it's going to help them move on to the next level or move on. I want to go here. Um, because I definitely want to, there's a couple of questions I still have to want to take from people that, that asked them to you. I want to talk about Illinois still, but I think it's really important to take a look at Braden Locke um, mm -hmm. coming into a, a, obviously a tough situation. We talked to his head coach today, effusive praise for Braden from his head coach, which you would expect, but it's also great to hear. What was your impression of Braden Locke uh, coming into the middle of that game? He plays beyond his years. I was you know, watching this morning, I was watching his, uh, talking to the media and it's like, like he, you would think this is a 25 year old man with the way he carries himself, the way he talks, he's, he's a 19 year old kid. Mm -hmm. And so his, just his poise in terms of his body language is incredible. And then, so when you, the way he got thrown in there, you know, and we can question whether or not there should have been a timeout called or anything like that to get him ready. It was, okay, boom, Braden, get your helmet, get on the field, line up. And by the way, we're going to throw all curl on the first play. Okay, watch for the safety. And he did it. And and so he plays beyond his years in a lot of areas. Uh, his processing is really fast. You can tell he understands the offense. There is no translating going on in his head. You know, I think Tanner Mordecai, you know, as much as he's been in this offense before, that was two years ago and it was with a different coach. And so, but Braden has, he, all he's had time to do since he got on campus was study and he's ready mm -hmm. in terms of his footwork, his mental ability. He's still going to make freshman mistakes and he did make some freshman mistakes and, you know, some slightly boneheaded decisions in terms of how to run with the football. But his poise in the pocket, his his willingness to get hit. I mean, I'm you see, I remember when he took that that late hit, he got up and he was jawing right back, get a little bit of taste of blood in his mouth and he's ready to go. And it's there's a reason why we, we wanted him. When he became available, there's a reason why we took him, even though we had, you know, Nick Evers. He's he's that guy in terms of mentality, and he's got the football skill. I mean, to put up those kind of numbers in high school in Texas, at that level, in Texas, that's the highest. Don't level. yeah, you do you doesn't doesn't does matter how big you are when it, you can play. And people might question his size and stuff like that. Well, he's taller than Russell Wilson, so he'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. And. I think, I think he has the ability to be a good one. Um, you know, I was really looking forward to him becoming the starter next year. Now get a little bit of preview. And I think that's what people need to take into this, that this is a preview. This is a, a test run. Any opinion that we make on brain lock should not be made like set in stone at the end of this season. You know, this is his tryout to show, okay, is this what we're going to be going into next year or are we going to have to have competition? Is and it he, and it, yeah, and it's going to be good for him. And I think it's going to get, it's going to give him it's going to give him tape on himself playing against real competition that he can build on going into into spring ball next year when the competition is going to get 
pretty fierce with Nick Evers coming up and the much mm-hmm. ballyhooed recruit coming in. You know, it's all eyes are going to be on the quarterback room again next year with some real competition. Yep. And I think he's got the mentality to do it. Don't put um... – don't don't consider for a second that Longo won't go back in the portal either. Find another. Quarterback. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Because be a- I, I think I think the quarterback there is going to be some, some people leaving that quarterback room, this this winter, um, and if there is a veteran who becomes available, mm-hmm. I don't think he would hesitate to bring him in. If anything, to say, hey, you are going to be a quarterback in our system. Okay, you need to be a mentor. You need to be a leader in the room, and you need to push these kids. Because our most our most experienced quarterback next year is going to be a redshirt sophomore, and that's something we just don't have at Wisconsin ever. I mean, yeah. pretty much if you, if if you played before your redshirt junior year, something was wrong. And Graham Mertz, I mean, he only played because Jack Cohn got injured, and. So that's what happens. I mean, Brooks Bollinger, for the greatest quarterback in Wisconsin history, other than, you know, the guys we've mentioned, he only played because Kavanaugh got hurt. Mm-hmm. And so. There's a need for a vet. There really is. Yeah. And he, yeah. if it's a guy, you, you bring him in and you say, hey, we'll give you a, a real chance to compete. And there'll be a veteran quarterback that'll say, okay, I'll take mm-hmm. that in the long offense if, if I'm yeah. competing these younger players. All right, we, we're going to come up. I, I want to ping Coach on what taking Tanner's legs out of this offense could do and uh, continue to talk maybe a little Illinois. That's coming up next. But first, I want to tell you about our good friends over at Jace Medical. Jace Medical is a great way if you're somebody that wants to keep prepared. I have a family. It's really important for me to be prepared in case of an emergency, in case something happens. And I, I have kind of a survival area set up in the basement just with some supplies and stuff, whatever. I'm not crazy about it but I like being prepared. That's what Jace Medical allows me to be for my family in case I can't get to a pharmacy, in case there's a power outage, a storm, whatever it is. I have the Jace case, uh, five life-saving antibiotics, all in a case with instructions, guidance, how to use it from board certified physicians, ongoing care from the physicians for any treatment related questions, doctor created and doctor recommended. That's why I have my Jace case because I want to be empowered to take care of my family. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off using my code LOCKEDON at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Empower your family. Empower yourself to protect your family. Okay, let's continue this conversation with Coach Anderson. Uh, Coach, one of the things I really wanted to to just get your take on, we've talked about, I'm excited to see uh, Braden Lock the thrower. I think the timing could be better. I think the receivers could be, play better. But we are taking Mordecai's legs out of this element. That that is a, been a big part of what Wisconsin has done this year offensively. That when they've had success, yep. um, I think it's eased the burden on the offensive line. It's it's kind of allowed some broken plays to work out okay. Where do, where how does Wisconsin? I don't I, I don't want to say get better, but how do they maintain having some type of offensive success without that running threat from the quarterback spot? Well, I think we saw it against Iowa is he's capable of being in the zone read game. He's not going to be uh, a carry the ball 10, 10 times a game on design QB run stuff, but he's, he's quick enough that if he reads an end and the flats open, he's going to take off. So I think that will be fine. I think where we're going to lose is Tanner's ability to break pocket when the pocket breaks down and to get out. That is going to be a little bit of an issue. Uh, It's going to come down to whether Braden's pocket presence and feel of the pocket is going to force him into those scrambling situations. The more I watch Braden against Iowa, the more I think maybe Tanner was a little bit jumpy. And he took off a little bit earlier than maybe he should have, because if the freshman can sit in the pocket relatively comfortably and throw the ball, maybe that's where the disconnect came from. And and his seeing the game differently is going to affect how much he scrambles. Um, 
Now, hopefully the uh, Illinois didn't watch how Iowa schemed up some of the blitz schemes that put our tackles on skates. And, you know, that's the safety was Braden did the right thing. He stepped up into the pocket because they sent a blitz that sent Malman inside and there's free rusher on the outside. So he stepped up and he stepped right into an unblocked defensive tackle because Bordellini got beat. Mm -hmm. So I think what they're going to, you might see them do is maybe move the pocket a little bit more, do a little bit like semi rolls uh, off of play action and, and stuff like that to get it, to move him away from, from the pressure that you know is going to be coming and allow him to use what he's best at, which is throwing the ball downfield. So I think the production in terms of rushing yards are going to go down, but the production as in total yards from the quarterback position are going to at minimum stay the same. I, I they, they will be able to make up the production that they're losing on scrambles and design QB runs with Braden. I'm excited to see him throw. Honestly, I'm just excited mm -hmm. to see a crisper. I think he can be a crisper passer and a better downfield passer. Uh, I I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but I'm excited for that. I said really quick, I said an over under 190 passing yards this weekend for Braden Lock. Where would you go on that? Keep in mind, Mordecai only had two games where he went over 190 this year. Yeah, I will be conservative and say under. Uh I'll be more. I would, I'll, well, by the way, I would be more bullish and say he'd be he'll be over sixty percent completion percentage. I'll be over and say I think he's going to throw a touchdown pass or two. And I don't want to put things on the yards right now because it's really going to depend on what the what the game plan mm -hmm. comes down to and how they're going to attack Iowa's defense or Iowa's Illinois defense. Uh, so he's cap he's perfectly capable and he you know you get that completion percentage up a little bit from from the Iowa game and he could push that push that number already you know to get to get 190 yards is going to be about 19 completions 20 completions mm -hmm. i think he's perfectly capable of that but whether yeah. the game plan will allow it i think that's exact i went under cuz i it's you know it's still listen it's a it's a road game he's still young they may be relatively conservative because of it Illinois does have a good defense they're not a pushover mm -hmm. defensively but I also said look listen anything between like one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty is not going to shock me I, I you know like I I don't really know I don't have a great feel on it um, yeah speaking of that I want to get into Illinois prediction w what's your quick feel on this game coming up Wisconsin going on the road coming off that tough Iowa loss well. Illinois, I mean, we've already seen the defense because it's exactly what Purdue runs. I mean, it's exactly the same. There's not much different other than personnel. And at times against Purdue, we were moving the ball at will. I mean, we had how many consecutive scoring drives. The scheme fits well with what we're trying to do. Um, Illinois is going to give us more chances because Altmaier is careless with the football. They are, I think I looked it up to today, they are like 118th in turnover margin. You know, he, he's he's for a pick. He's due for a fumble. We're going to get extra opportunities uh, because of that. They're pretty decent against the run. They're not that great against the pass. They're, they're not bad, but they're not nothing to write home about. And Purdue ran all over them. Nebraska was consistent against them. They weren't great, but I mean, Nebraska's terrible and they were still able to move the ball. Uh, Maryland was able to move the ball against them. Uh, Kansas beat them up. Toledo was a field goal in the last play of the game away from pulling the upset. So mm -hmm. there, there's Illinois does a lot of good things defensively. They're just not that good overall yet. Um, and I, if we play well, it's, it's beatable. That's the key thing because again, Purdue ran all over them, just, you know, beat them by what 30 mm -hmm. and, you know, Penn state who runs a similar system 
had no, they were able to grind it out. Kansas was able to grind it out. These power spread air raid ish kind of offenses have had success against them. Um, Do you get so, worried about, because when people hear, I think when people hear grind it out, the first question, I, to me, it's not even a Longo thing. I think Longo would be comfortable doing that, even though I know that the numbers skew weirdly in that last mm-hmm. Iowa game. Can Braylon Allen last in a game where we need to grind it out? Well, and I think when I'm when I'm thinking more grinding, it, it's not necessarily four yards in a cloud of dust. It's it's going to take a little bit for a score to break. Mm. You know, Penn State was like that. Penn St- the Penn State game, I think they they had like f- they started the game with like three or four straight drives where they would get down to the red zone and they would stall out and they would attempt they would kick a field goal. And I think they kicked like four field goals early in the game. And then eventually, okay, then they broke a play, stuff like that. So I think we're going to be able to move the ball. I think they're going to get tougher in the red zone. Uh, they're going to try to give him different looks to try to, to, to scheme away and make, make mistakes. But I think between the twenties, we're going to be able to move the ball. I think the fact that Braden is showing no qualms about just throwing it up and throwing with some pretty good accuracy that we might, we might catch him. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it takes, it takes a big play, you know, that we really haven't had much this year. You know, a big play in the passing game could just set off a spark. And that's what happened with Purdue. I mean, Purdue, like I said, Purdue's kind of ran all over them. And they got a couple of big plays and they forced some turnovers. And by, by the time you look up, it's 48 to 14. Hey, and let me ask you um, really quick, because we're up to 31 minutes. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but you, you mentioned getting to the red zone, defense stiffening up. We talked a little off, off show. Fourth and one, first drive against Iowa. Uh, obviously, Luke Fickle, Phil Longo, the coaching staff, went for it. Play didn't work. Did you like that call in the moment? I like the confidence. I like the confidence of the way the offense was moving. Like, yeah, we can get a yard for sure. Execution, you know, even Tanner Bordelini's snaps under center are slow. Go back and watch that. Go back and watch that snap. The entire right side of the offensive, you know, the offensive line was moving and Tanner Mordecai was still waiting for the ball. And then by the time he got it turned around, you know, that slowed everything down. Also, Cooper DeGene made an All-American play. So if he doesn't make an All-American play, we're gaining yards. The blocks were there. Um, So I like the aggressiveness. I like the confidence in the offense. Points are points. And I think if it was me, I would have kicked the field goal because points are points. And when you have an uh, essentially an automatic kicker, now, this would be different if it was last year right? I or the last that. couple of years where we haven't had a kicker who could kick a 30-yard field goal with any kind of confidence. Vakos, anything under 50, I'm pretty confident in. It feels so like he, He's got an NFL leg yeah. um, in terms of accuracy. So hindsight being 2020 in a game that turned out how it did, you take the points. I, I think, in, and I mentioned this too, I don't think that that's why we lost the game. You're no. not talking, right? I, I don't think if we kick a field goal there, we suddenly win that game every time. But in the moment, it just feels like if anytime you can put Iowa behind with their offense mm-hmm. and you're at home, first drive, it felt like a bigger momentum boost just to get points than the potential of them getting a stop. Right? Yeah, and it, and it was just a momentum killer where we, we came out and, and to get to that point, we drove, what, 80 yards? Because that drive started, that drive started on the four yard line. Like every drive of that game started on the four yard line, and they marched downfield, and you know they got into a right situation. You know, if it wasn't for the, you know, if, if it wasn't for the false start on third and two, on the on that drive, who knows? We wouldn't even be talking about this. And so, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, I, I think you take the points. Yeah, I agree. But I, I also don't think it was the – some fans made it out to to be the, the game-defining play if no, you make that no. field goal win. No. I, I take the points too. 
Uh, but I, I don't think it's a, a clear cut decision either way. Um, yeah. Anyway, this is Coach's Corner. Always one of my favorite shows of the week. He is Coach Anderson, Derry Ray. Go check out his channel. Go bump him up, Badger fans. Let's get that YouTube channel pumping. Um, Coach, we'll have you on again next week for sure. Maybe do I, I keep wanting to do a live show with you where people can ping and ask questions. I think we we're going to do that this week. Let's do that next week. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm uh, next couple weeks here. I don't have much football going on. So uh, anytime. I love it for everybody tuning in. Thank you so much on Wisconsin and we'll talk tomorrow.